Everyone looks wonderful. Even Ken Fitzgerald looks good today. <laughs> I knew you were listening. <laughs> Come on in and grab a seat and we'll get started. Brother Ben, how are you? I'm well, yes sir, I'm well. I, oh, he's giving short jokes already. Man, oh man, tough crowd, short jokes. Our speaker this morning is Doug Peters. As you've heard about this transition coming for quite some time, uh, as we transition from Terry to a new pulpit minister, we have engaged IMP, Interim Ministry Partners, and uh, the time is here. We're here. So we've had a good session with Doug, the, your uh, shepherds. We met with Doug for four hours on Friday night, and then we met uh, again yesterday, the shepherds and the search committee, the 13 members of the search committee, and another six or eight folks that are involved. Uh, and the elders, we all met again yesterday for about three hours and with Doug another hour or so afterwards. And uh, it's our pleasure to have Doug this morning. The goal this morning is for Doug to, get, to update the entire congreg congregation on the uh, transition, the interim process. So we want to make sure that we're operating with full transparency and everyone can have a part that you can have knowledge, that you can understand and, and be involved and have ownership in our transition as we seek to not only fill the pulpit minister role, but to also take this time of reflection and um, inward uh, looking at, at, uh, at how the Mesa body's doing. Doug is the uh, managing partner and vice president for IMP, Interim Ministry Partners, which is part of the HOPE uh, network. Uh, Doug, Doug preaches uh, there uh, locally in the uh, Houston area at Grace Community. Grace. Grace Crossing. Grace Crossing. Thank you and has preached at multiple locations in multiple states as well as been on staff at Oklahoma Christian in the, in, 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 in the past. Doug holds a PhD in spiritual discernment and the selection of leaders. So this is his passion uh, in helping churches work through this interim time and I'm sure that we will be blessed by him as well as Greg and the entire team that we are working with as we go through this time of transition. Good morning. I'm glad to be with you today. Um, I've had a great, great opportunity to, to get to know your, your elders, your shepherds here, uh, to spend time with uh, them, with their wives on Friday night. Uh, CR said four hours we talked, right? You know, I could almost see the anxiety in his, in his voice or hear it and sense it. Uh, it was a long time, but uh, we, we've done some work ahead of time on Zoom and phone calls and emails. We had an intense meeting on Friday night, intense because with a lot of information in a short period of time. I'm very impressed with your elders, their desire to serve the Lord alongside you and to guide you and lead you in serving the Lord here, Mesa, the Phoenix area. I, uh, I really, uh, there's one quiet elder, he's very, uh, he almost just kind of just sat there, didn't say, a, his, Jackie was his name, I think. <laughs> I, I don't know, I don't know. Really enjoyed uh, getting to meet each one of them. Isn't it amazing how, how God pulls people together to serve and gifts them and, and they are then uh, gifted to lead others and equip us so that you can use your gifts in the body of Christ? I mean, that's what we're talking about. That's what we're talking about. And then yesterday, it was that same group of guys and then we added some folks that are going to be a part of a search team. John's going to be, be leading that team right there. Got to spend some time during lunch with him and uh, great choice, uh, going to do so well. And a few other folks that I got to meet yesterday, very much a blessing. Uh, we've eaten well since we've been here. I, that's one thing I noticed. I'm going to tell Greg this is a 10-pound church. <laughs> you're going to gain 10 pounds while you're with these folks. Uh, I've pretty much decided that's probably about right, maybe 15. But Greg, Greg's thin. He's, he's thinner than me. So uh, You're going to be blessed. Greg Anderson will be here next weekend. He will be your, your interim minister for a season. Now, he is not going to be your new preacher. That's off the table. He's not the guy. You're going to fall in love with him, and you might, some of you might wish he would be, uh, but, but Greg's not going to be that. Greg is, is working with us. He's a vice president of Hope Network, and he's been in ministry a long time, but, but he is going to be your interim minister for a season. He's going to be preaching, and he's going to be uh, consulting with your leaders and this congregation, a consulting relationship, and he's going to be coaching the search team. I said three things, and I'll say them again. He's going to be preaching on Sundays. 
usually three out of four a month, and he'll work with your folks here coordinating the Sunday that he's not going to be there. He needs to see his wife and his children and grandchildren occasionally, you know, on a weekend. But he'll be here most of the time in this next season. And there's Jesus and Carmen, our old friends that did a Hispanic church plan in Arlington, Texas. And uh, man, they are just awesome, awesome, awesome folks. I love them dearly. They, they did such a wonderful job in, in Arlington, Texas, in a church plant. Uh, unbelievable. Great kingdom servants. Yeah, good to see you guys. Why are you late? No, <laughs> he's, he's already been to class some other church, I think, today. Um, uh, and, uh, and so we're, we're going to have Greg as a consistent preaching presence. We're going to have Greg as a consultant. You're, you're getting not just a preacher, you're getting a, a well-qualified consultant. Somebody that, that you would uh, be very privileged to have uh, to share with your leadership. He's going to be a confidential resource for your elders individually and collectively and for your congregation. It's like you're having a church doctor on site present with you. Not just a preacher, but, but a preacher, a, a church consultant that's here for a period of time. Great opportunity. And, and he's going to coach your search team. Now, most of the time, whenever a preacher transitions, you've had a, a good brother in Terry that's been here a lengthy time, done a good ministry, and, and is, is leaving in an honorable, uh, very much blessed kind of way. Um, then some people get anxious and, and they just want to run as fast as they can and let's go get the next one okay now what i want everybody to do right now on the count of three is i want you to inhale one two i didn't count to three yet one two three now exhale slowly relax it's going to be okay it's going to be okay um, some folks just get really anxious in times like this because everything's changing. It's different now. We're, we're used to something, and now all of a sudden we're not. Well, we're going, to, we're going to make the most of this season, this transition season. We call it an interim season. We're going to make the most of it. You'll see right up here, there's a, underneath interim ministry partners, and my wife pointed out that I didn't put a space between Mesa and church. So I'll just make sure that if any of the rest of you notice that, you're like my wife, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, she, she caught that. I need to fix that. But, but from transition to transformation. Okay, life is full of transitions, and transition is inevitable. But transformation is not inevitable. Transition happens all the time. It's inevitable, but transformation is optional. Will we take the opportunity to be transformed by God during this transition season? That's what we're interested in. IMP will not pick your new preacher. We have never picked a preacher for anybody. Okay, you know who will make the final decision about who your next preacher will be? Your elders. Now, they're working with a search team that we're going to be coaching and helping them. But they're going to make that selection. We will not pick your preacher, right? Okay, just know that up front. That's the job of your leaders here. Uh, we are not a headhunter service. We're not monster.com. We come alongside you, share some good process and some best practices that have proven effective over time in lots and lots and lots of churches. And we allow you to work that process because we believe you need to have the ownership of that process. It does no good for us to own that for you because we're going to get back on an airplane and go back to wherever we came from. you got to live with that new preacher. I don't. Greg doesn't. And so that's why it's very important during this transition season, this interim season, that, that you invest yourselves in the church. There's going to be something for everybody to do. Okay, this needs to be a foundational prayerful process. Spiritual discernment. Uh, if you're not into prayer and fasting, you need to get into prayer and fasting. Uh, read the first 15 chapters of the book of Acts and, and look at how the early church made decisions and say, okay, that's the kind of atmospheric, spiritual atmosphere that we need to have. 
So very, very important. So what I've told you so far is you're going to have Greg Anderson. And, and I want to tell you, I want everybody to, next week when Greg's here, ask him to walk on the water for you because I'm building Greg up. He can walk on water. I mean, the guy is good. You're getting a, an awesome, awesome interim minister. You will fall in love with Greg. He will encourage you. He will also, secondly, challenge you. He wouldn't be doing his job if he just encouraged you. He needs to challenge you to be more effective disciples of Jesus, to think about who you're going to be in this next season. Because we don't want just to get a new preacher. We want to take advantage of this time to transition and be transformed. This is a season. It's a window of opportunity for God to do some things in your life that you rarely have this occasion. And so we want you to take advantage of that. Uh, we mentioned that we're part of Hope Network Ministries. Uh, many, many, many years ago, 25 years ago, a guy named Lynn Anderson helped start Hope Network and mainly mentoring preachers and elders. He, he observed that, that elders are, are lonely and it's a tough deal and they need to be mentored. And, and in certain parts of the country, uh, churches don't interact, uh, interact a lot with each other. And so elders just needed encouragement and preachers needed encouragement. So Lynn started Hope Network for that reason. And then a few years ago, our founder, Tim Woodruff, said, hey, let's, uh, we're doing some of the same things in a lot of the same places. Let's link up together. And so we've kind of become under the umbrella of Hope Network Ministries. Uh, a little bit about uh, biblical theological foundations for what we're doing. I want to tell you that this is not just about pragmatics and demographics. If you hear that today, you're hearing incorrectly and I'm doing a horrible job communicating. This is about spiritual discernment. This is about trusting God to work in our lives. But we need to seek the presence of God. We need to be prayerful during this time. Trusting God to lead us to conclusions about the future of this church, right? We believe that, 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 that where God guides, God provides, and, and God's Spirit is, is alive and well in us individually and collectively. And so we want this to be a spiritual endeavor, a spiritual exercise. Um, we, we think that God has a call in the life of, of every church. God has a call in the lives of leaders and, and hearing and, and, and submitting to that call. That's job one. Who does God want you to be today and tomorrow and next year and next decade? That's a question worth asking. Remember when Jesus prayed down on the mountainside, he called those he wanted to be with him. He, he designated them as people to be sent out. That's what apostles mean. And, and he was going to send them out to preach. Okay, and, and so we believe that God still wants to send people out into the world to make a difference in the kingdom of God. Uh, some of us do that in, in, in more formal roles and recognized roles and upfront roles maybe like preachers. But all of us have that obligation. And so we want you during this season to be asking the question, how is God calling me to be a better follower of Jesus, a disciple of Jesus Christ? That's a question worth asking for every one of us young old, in the middle somewhere? It's a great question. Uh, you know, God uses times of transition. You know that, that 40 years in the wilderness, right? Uh, before that, the, the, the season with Moses, I mean, uh, the season with Noah, rather, uh, through the kings, through the judges, there are all these seasons. Uh, the earliest church was primarily a, a Jerusalem, Judea, Hebrew-based church, and, and then the Gentiles, Acts chapter 1, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Okay? Uh, I believe that, and by the way, those are red letters in the book of Acts. Not all the red letters are in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's Jesus. And so we know at Pentecost what happened in a very special way with the coming of the Holy Spirit. We know that Peter preached what we call that first gospel sermon, right? And, and they asked, what should we do to be saved? And he said, repent, every one of you. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and that you would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Those people were cut to their heart. They had a message and then they had a mission. They had a cause. And then you read Acts 2, 42 through 47 there, and, and it, it, it just describes in a very beautiful, picturesque kind of way of the life and community that early church lived together. And we want to encourage you in those ways during this season. Um, you're going to hear me say this today at least once or twice. If you don't know who you are, you can't know who you need or what you need to do. Okay, 
If you're one of those folks that gets a little anxious and you didn't inhale on the count of three and you didn't exhale and relax and your blood pressure and your heart rate go down just a little bit, if you're, if you're wound kind of tightly, I want you to hear this. You have no business going out and hiring a preacher without spending some time thinking about who we are and who God's calling us to be into the future. You really, really, really need to do that. So I want to encourage you to do just that. Um, communal discernment, okay? Don't think Karl Marx and communism. Think community. Think corporate. Think working together in the body of Christ. Um, do you remember that meeting in Acts chapter 15? The basic concept there was how Jewish do Gentile converts need to become? And, and they decided, frankly, not very much. But then they, they said some things there like, uh, let's don't make it hard on the Gentiles who are coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. James said that. Peter speaks up and, and, and perhaps tells the story of, the, of how God is incorporating the Gentiles into his fold. And, uh, and then they, they write it down. They say, you know, it seems good to the Holy Spirit and to us. And notice the confidence they had. They were so aligned with the Holy Spirit of God that, that when they did what they thought was best as a community of faith, they attributed it to the Holy Spirit and to themselves. They had so aligned themselves to God's Spirit so that when they did what they thought was best, it was indeed the will of God. Now, don't ask me to explain all that 100%. But I want to tell you, I want to align myself so much with God's will so that whenever... Doug does what Doug thinks is best. It is indeed aligned with the will of God. You see, I want to grow closer to the will of God. I want to be transformed increasingly to look like Jesus and act like Jesus and think like Jesus. A few basics. Um, <clears throat> I've already told you a little bit of this, uh, but, but repetition's good. You're getting just a little bit... The group Friday night and yesterday got a lot more. I'm going to give a, a 7,500-foot flyover view is what I'm going to give on this one. Uh, typically, when we talk about interim ministry, we say, well, we need to get somebody to preach because we've got to have a preacher. The people show up at uh, either 9.30 or 10.30. And if nobody's there to preach, you know, they're going to be bending an elder's ear. So we got to get somebody to preach. So we, we get lined up. You know, we get a calendar out. We say, who can do it this week? And let's get brother so-and-so from over here. And there's that guy over there. We'll get them to preach. Okay. That's typically what we've done kind of in the past on interim ministry. Uh, but, but we're not just concerned about that consistent preaching presence. We are, and it's important. And, and we'll make sure that the pulpit here is filled appropriately with a godly, gifted preacher. But it's about more than that. That consistent preaching presence, that consulting relationship and consulting conversations that sometimes churches need to have. There's a lot of things that kind of go on under, under the surface sometimes that we don't talk about. And sometimes it's a helpful season to talk about those things. This is a safe time to talk about those things. And we'll be encouraging your leadership, Greg will, along the way. And then, of course, we're going to look for a new preacher. We're going to, we're going to coach you your team, in a search process. We will not pick your preacher, all right? You will. All right, uh, some principles here. Um, I'll just throw all these up here. Uh, we're going to think church first and candidate. So if you've got a name and you think that guy would be the next best, greatest preacher for this congregation, inhale, exhale, put it in your pocket, and wait. Okay, because we're thinking the church first. We're going to talk about how we can use this season, this window of opportunity that we've been given to maximize it so that then we can find somebody that is aligned with where this church is going. Too often churches go hear a sermon and they think it's just awesome and so they go get a preacher and he's going this way and the rest of the church is going this way. Well, guess what happens? Rip. Doesn't work. Think church first, then candidates. Uh, your elders are equipping very well, I might add. They're getting some of the best coaching available. 
a search team, and so there's a reliance. I've challenged your elders to, to shepherd and pray for this church during this season like they never have before. That's really, really important. Uh, we're not going to put a bunch of ads out there in the Christian Chronicle and the Gospel Advocate and this Christian College job search board and that Christian College job search board. Uh, we're not going to find you know, 25 guys that, that, that got fired recently and we need to pick one. of. You know, that's not the approach we're taking here. We're going to look for rather quality candidates over quantity of potential options for the preacher. It will be a relational search process. You see, some people on your team will be contacting a potential preacher. And it's based on who you are as a church that you're going to clarify that, focus a little bit more. And it's going to be on who you think is the kind of minister, description of that person, that would be best for you to work with. And then they're going to get to know that person. Somebody makes an initial call, sends an email, develop a relationship, set up a Zoom call, bring in a couple of other people from the search team. We're getting to know them. And we'll, we'll help them with some potential interview questions and some scripts for, you know, make it your own. But here's some guides. John will, and his team will have access to all that on some project management software called Trello. Thousands of pages of information there to, to be helpful to you. They'll get to know them, and then they'll take, if it's somebody they're really excited about and think that's a great fit, because we've discerned God's will, and we've gone through this transformative discovery process, and we believe that, that this is the, the next direction, the next uh, emphasis for who we are as a congregation. This is the good DNA that we've had that we want to continue in our congregation, and so therefore, this is the kind of minister that we need to go with us to step into God's future, and so they'll have a, a church profile and an ideal preacher package, if you will, this is who we think we need, because you, you don't know who you need till you know who you are and who God's calling you to be. And, and then the whole committee will go in, and, and they'll be staying in touch with your elders, and, and then they will work toward a consensus to, uh, to select somebody to be the next preacher of this church. Uh, great opportunities during this time. I just uh, put, you know, 10 of those things, I think, up there. Uh, this is a time to celebrate. God's been doing something here for almost 75 years. In a couple of years, you're going to have your 75th anniversary. Wouldn't it be awesome that at your 75th celebration, uh, that you were able to, you know, stand a little taller and say, hey, look at what God has done, and look what God is doing, and look what we anticipate God will do. I'm prayerful for you in that regard. That'll be an awesome thing. Uh, it's, it's a chance to listen, listen to God in our community, to hear, hear how God wants to use us through scripture, through prayer, through the discussions that we have with each other. It's a chance to clarify God's calling. What's the mission of this church? Well, somebody might quote Matthew 28, 18 through 20, right? Therefore, we're going to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I've commanded you, and lo, I will be with you always to the very end of the age. And you say, okay... That's great, Doug. I know that. But, but how are you doing that? Practically speaking. How are you doing that? Clarify that mission. It'll be a chance for you to, to bolster your congregational leadership. Your elders can, can learn how to eld a little better. Shepherd a little better. Oversee a little better. Um, they can do that individually and collectively. They've got a consultant that's going to be with them three weekends a month to be able to help them and others. Also, the old rising tide raises all boats. John and his team are going to be leading out in perhaps the most um, uh, challenging uh, spiritual endeavor they have yet thus far taken in the church. And they're going to do nothing but grow. That team will. It'll be great. Uh, it's an opportunity to, to examine ourselves and look at ourselves a little bit and say, hey, what are, what are the really great qualities we have and what are one or two things that maybe we're not the most proud of? All of us have those tendencies in our own lives, right? Tell me three things that, that you really feel good about in your walk with the Lord, Doug, and your discipleship. One, two, three. Tell me one thing, Doug, that, that, that you like to change. Or better yet, ask Cheryl and, and she can... She can fill me in because she, she loves me and she knows me and she, she can carefully and lovingly help me along the way. And, and you're going to have those opportunities in discussion. 
Um, sometimes there are some personal things we need to deal with among leadership and other such things. We get a chance to focus on the things that really matter. The first important, weightier, greatest, and second greatest kinds of things. Uh, we get a chance to, uh, churches are a lot like big family, extended families, right? We get a chance to kind of deal with that stuff. It's complex. You have somebody here that's an expert in Greg Anderson in working through systems in churches. How do you bring alignment? You say you want to do this, but you're functioning like you want to do that. How do you bring alignment to those two? That's very important. Greg can help you to that. You're going to have a chance to listen to your neighbors, to go out, uh, to not just come in here and guess what we think we can do to best serve our community. We are going to have a chance to go out and ask some of those folks how we can serve this community. Big difference between those two things. Um, and we're going to find a new guy. No, you're going to find a new guy. That's what we're going to do. All right. Uh, we, we gave you a little survey. This was just a quick little dirty survey to, to say, hey, here's what we're going to do. Uh, uh, tell us about yourself. Answer a few questions. It compares you with hundreds of other churches. And we'll just kind of uh, make some assignments on some scores kind of arbitrarily uh, with, uh, with, in comparison directly with other churches and, and rate you as far as health and effectiveness and that sort of thing. Just a quick thing. You'll, you'll be able to participate in a much more in-depth congregational survey later. About 150-something of you figured out on this one and, and took it. Uh, mostly female. You had a fairly low percentage of, of males take this. But I'm looking at this audience, I would say that, that you're a majority female attendee church, at least in this audience right here. I, I'm, I have a pretty good view to be able to say that. Um, your age, you skew older as a church. You do. We spent a lot of time in depth unpacking this stuff on, uh, on Friday night and a little bit yesterday. I won't spend as much time today on that. Uh, you're a veteran disciples church, right? 43% uh, of the people that took that survey have been a Christian 40 plus years. Uh, but I want to ask before I get to the next slide, um, I want you to raise your hand if you came to the Lord and were baptized when you were with a community of, of faith other than the Mesa Church of Christ. So if you came to the Lord initially in a church other than the Mesa Church of Christ, would you raise your hand right now? Look around. Okay, most of you, that's fine. Most of you didn't come to the Lord in this church. Most of you transferred in. Most of you transferred in, right? You, you moved to Phoenix or you moved across town and, and you, you ended up here with this community of faith. And that's great. And we want more and more people to join you. Okay? But just simply making the point that, um, that even though you've been Christians a long time, most of you came uh, to the Lord in a different place. On the count of three, I want people to name the state, nice and loudly, name the state in which you came to the Lord and were baptized. The state in which you were baptized. Okay? Or, or the nation. I learned yesterday. On the count of three. One, two, three. Arizona. Most, you know, um, there were a few Arizonas, obviously. <laughs> but not as many as you might expect. Okay? We live in a mobile society. Most of you have, have come in from somewhere else. Some of you came to the Lord and, and came to faith when you were in this community of faith. Um, Here's your stats recently, the data given to me. Been a fairly stable congregation for a lengthy period of time. The purple line is AM worship. Uh, all uh, The blue line is AM worship English. The green line is AM worship Spanish. Okay, you, I, I don't know what to do with the, the, you know, the 2021 thing. That's, that's COVID. That's all. We're figuring that out. We're coming out of that. Uh, some of you are online right now. Hello at home. Um, that's just the nature of the times. Uh, Bible classes here. By the way, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in Bible classes. Glad you're here for this one. Uh, baptisms over recent years at this church. I'm a big believer in getting people baptized. Uh, weekly giving kind of goes up. Over time, 
uh, uh, an interesting little thing of, of dollars per person per week. Whenever we see that going up, that's almost always an indicator of a church that's plateaued or declining. Uh, churches that are growing usually have a, a decreasing dollars per person per week. Just a little thumbnail of, of churches. Uh, uh, you know, when, when, I, when I go into church and, and uh, it's been declining, but yet the contribution has been staying the same or creeping up, that means that, that some people in that church are just sacrificing more every single year. You know, most likely, you know, if you took away the, the contributions for those uh, 70 and older or 60 and older at this church, it'd be a very difficult uh, financial environment for this congregation. Um, your 2020 population, uh, both in Phoenix and uh, in Mesa, indicate that this is a growing area. Phoenix is the fifth largest city in America, right? Uh, and, and Mesa's been growing over the last decade at a rate of about 1.91%, which means that, that while you have stayed fairly steady or maybe dropped a little bit in that same 10-year period, the population around you has grown. So your kingdom impact, your kingdom footprint is dramatically decreased. If you go back 20 years ago when there were 850 to 900 and something people here and you were a parking problem for the neighborhood, um, and, and then you sent some people for another congregation. Well, now you add up that congregation's average attendance and this congregation's average attendance, it's about half of what that was 20 years ago with that one church. Meanwhile, the population of your area has increased. So, so decrease, increase. The kingdom footprint, the kingdom impact related to this community of faith has gotten smaller over the last decade, maybe longer. Okay, um, I, I, you guys got an average level of wellness, kind of up in the, the top end of the average level of wellness. That's really good. I want to commend you. Um, now, here's how I would give the quick update. If the doctor were going over to the side there after they met with you and they're speaking into their transcriber, I would say something like, factoring the metrics data provided by the church and data from those engaged enough to take the survey, the Mesa Church Christ is an average congregation of hell for a church that's generally been stable over recent years, has a declining kingdom footprint in a growing area, has a membership that have been Christians a long time, skews older and aging, and isn't engaging or retaining younger people at the same rate as older people, and is in a spiritual heritage that is declining. Churches of Christ in America are shrinking rather dramatically. There, there are probably nine to now maybe 10 or 12 churches of Christ closing their doors in the United, in the United States of America every month. Since COVID, that's probably going to pick up. I, get, I shared some studies with the people Friday night and yesterday. Um, Anne is facing the uncertainties of a pandemic. Okay, that's my, my quick little summary. Okay. Um, by the way, uh, average health for a person that's, that's 80 or 81, like my dad, um, is different than average health for a person that's in their 50s, like I am. Right? An average health for a 50-something-year-old is different than average health for an 81-year-old. So, so keep that in mind. Okay, uh, just really quickly, um, I want to tell you that the most positive, healthy responses involve leadership. I, I told your elders to try, to try to reach back and pat themselves on the back a little bit. They've been doing a good job here, according to you especially in relation to times of crisis and criticism and decision-making, which, which I wanted to encourage them with that and I also wanted to challenge them. So, so the church thinks highly of you, so now lead them into being more effective disciples. That was my challenge to them. <clears throat> and uh, the low lights, the, the lower scores there is uh, working with others. You're, the people here that perceive you guys as kind of insular and, and working primarily among yourselves, and not among others out there in the community or in other churches. Uh, aversion to risk and change, a really low score there on, on we like it the way we like it kind of thing, you know. Uh, mission familiarity and clarity. Um, if, we, if we all said uh, the state in which we were baptized, it would sound kind of like that. If we all said, what's this church about? It might sound a little more like seek Jesus, find Jesus, share Jesus, but um, you indicated that really and truly not everybody would say that, or we really don't have meat on those bones to know what that means. Uh, lack of spiritual accomplishments, a few, 
but we'd like to see that score higher. And then one thing that stuck out was the disparity in generational perspectives. Uh, those that are under 40 uh, don't think near as positively about this congregation as those who are over 40. It's not everybody, but the scores were significant whenever we broke those out. So just FYI. All right, so we said, hey, uh, here's a, a model. It's just a model, but uh, phases of a church's life cycle. Uh, they're like our bodies. We're, we launch, we grow, uh, we get strategic in our growth, we get a fine running machine, sustained health, then we slip into maintenance mode, then we're trying to preserve. Some of you think I'm talking about you every morning when you look in the mirror here on this thing, but, but we're talking about the life cycle of, of a group of people. Uh, then we slip into preservation mode, right? That's kind of the mode I think I'm in right now. I'm trying to preserve some things here. Um, and then, of course, life support and death. It's, that's how human beings kind of go. And, and guess what? Congregations tend to follow that same kind of model. And so we ask uh, uh, folks, uh, Friday night, we ask folks with much more detail than you're getting today and much more understanding of the statistics and things. And we said, where are you? And uh, what they said was somewhere between maintenance and preservation, probably up here on the maintenance side a little bit more, was the indication both on Friday night and on Saturday. That was not us telling you that. That was what you said. So FYI. Now, the, the really key thing, those that study congregations a lot in, in America and beyond say that when you get over here to maintenance, you better go back here and redream the dream. If you get too far down here, you reach a point of no return, right? And that's why we have at least nine or ten congregations every single month, Churches of Christ in the United States, that are shutting down. All right? So, um, I, I want to uh, really talk about... Uh, uh, the process. So I'm going to just let you look at these. Uh, Greg can have these kinds of conversations with your team, with your elders, uh, and with this congregation. Those are all really important things to, to have. When you have a consultant in, on, in by, that means I have five minutes, right? Perfect. This is where, exactly where I wanted to be at five minutes in. All right. So the search process. Uh, we're going to have a team chair. That's John, uh, elder staff liaison. That's CR. We're going to have a prayer person here. That's going to be the person that makes sure this is a spiritual process. We can all assume prayer, but it's too important to leave it up for assumption. It needs to be intentional and proactive. We want this to be a prayerful process. Uh, we're going to make use of technology. Trello, project management software, lots of Zoom meetings with people right now that we have. Uh, we need a communications chair. We need a secretary. Uh, we're going to do a congregational assessment. We're going to do a major survey. That, this one, the little one I gave you guys only took six. Six minutes was the average. I have a data point there that it took you six minutes to take that thing. If it took you longer than that, you're a little little slower than the average. If it took you quicker than that, you're a little quicker than the average. But we're going to give you one that's a lot bigger than that, more in-depth. It's going to be tailored and customized to your congregation. Your leadership will know more about your church. Your church will know more about your church. Your team will administer that survey. We won't do it for you. Your team will administer that survey. It will be customized to your church. You'll know a lot more about your church. Uh, we're going to go out into the community, and we're going to talk to people uh, in schools, in city government, in the nonprofits, the people helping things. We're going to ask questions like, if somebody were going to serve in the name of Jesus in a way that makes a difference in this community, what would they do? We can sit around in our non-smoke-filled room on a Wednesday night trying to figure that out, or we can go out and ask them. And that's what we're going to do. You're going to do. Uh, and kingdom assessment. We're going to go talk to other churches. Find out how they're serving and, and the ones that we perceive are effective. Not so we can adopt their doctrine, not so we can adopt their worship style, but so we can see what they're doing in the community, how they're serving, how they're trying to make a difference. And, and sometimes we, we learn from them and say, we need to do something similar to that. Sometimes we say, you know what, they've got that covered, but this area over here is neglected. We really need to focus here. Uh, we're, going to, uh, we're going to look back at our history and, and find the good DNA, those good things over the last 75 years that we just need to add fuel to. That's really, really important. Uh, we're going to work off a system of recommenders. Recommenders. And so, so you have contacts. Your team has contacts. Your elders have contacts. We also at IMP have contacts. And so when you decide, here's who God's calling us to be, and so here's the kind of description we want for our congregation for looking for a preacher, we want them to know about this about us and where we're going. 
Well, we need to give that to some recommenders. And here's the kind of person we believe that needs to join us in that. We need to give that to some recommenders. And so then, all those recommenders, we're going to call them, we're going to say, we're going to send you this email that has these two documents, who we are, who we think we need. And what we want you to do is take a week and pray for that, and then I'm going to call you back in another week. And I don't want 20 guys who need a job. I want you to, to think about who we are and who God's calling us to be and the kind of person we want to join with in this and partner with. And we'd like for you to give us a name or two, something like that. And so we're working on a quality of candidates versus quantity of candidates. Really, really important. So somebody's got to come up with uh, some of those descriptions there. All right. Um, basically, last slide that I'll be showing you here today. Uh, we've done a lot of the pre-work already. A little bit of that continues, but, but we've done a lot of that. Uh, we're going to start inquiring, and we're going to be asking, asking uh, uh, questions about this congregation, right? We'll do a congregational assessment. We'll do a community assessment. We'll do uh, an assessment in the, in, in the broader world out there with some other churches around our area for the reasons I mentioned earlier. And, and we're going to then start building that congregational profile, the profile of the, the candidate, the person that's gonna be right to work alongside us. Then we're gonna to try to start identifying, you know, who is that? We're gonna use those recommenders. And then we're gonna start interviewing, and we'll help you that. We, we have sample scripts for introducing ourselves relationally to these potential ministers. It's going to be very confidential. John and his team, we're, we're messing with people's lives when we start talking to them. It needs to be confidential, all right? If you're nosy, park it, right? If you can't be confidential, be confidential. Um, and, and then we're going to issue an invitation, and then we're not going to drop you. We want to continue on, and we want to work together. All right. All um, right. Holy God, thank you for the opportunity to be with these great folks in Mesa. Lord, I pray for them. I pray that they will take advantage of this opportunity, not just to get a new preacher, but an opportunity to not just transition, but rather an opportunity uh, to be transformed during this process. Well, and we look to the future, Lord. And so we pray for the next season. May it be a time of transformation. To your glory, O oh God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, and in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.